Uh, so, uh, my name is Justin Gottschlick, and today I'll be talking about the draft specification of transactional constructs for C++. Um, before I begin, I'd like to just quickly acknowledge uh, my collaborators uh, for this project. Uh, Hans Bohm, Hans is here. Uh, he will be giving the keynote uh, tomorrow on uh, C++ concurrency, I think, uh, shared variables and threads. Uh, so that's sure to be very exciting, so uh, try not to miss that one. Uh, and then also Victor Lechengo and Mark Bower from Sun Labs, uh, Tatiana Speisman, who's also at Intel with me, and then finally Michael Wong, uh, who we all know and love, uh, from IBM. Uh, so today I'll be giving a talk in a little bit of different format than what I've done in the past. Uh, I know that a lot of you know me. I've spoken at BoostCon on transactional memory for the last three years, and you know I like to move around and stuff. And usually my talks are sort of of the lecture format, but today I'm hoping this will be a little bit more interactive. And the reason why is I've sort of been given this charge, and that charge is to really try to bridge what's going on with Boost and the C++ transactional memory specification. Uh, last year we came here and we presented and we realized that there was a little bit of a disconnect between uh, the work that we were doing and uh, what was going on in the Boost community and we really want to make sure that uh, we don't have that disconnect in the future. So. The way this will sort of unravel is I'll first give an overview of transactional memory. For those of you who don't know anything about transactional memory, don't worry. Uh, hopefully we'll go over the basics enough to where you'll understand the core ideas. And for those of you that are more expert TM people or understand the basics, hopefully we'll get into some really interesting uh, scenarios. You'll be able to see some cool things that you can do with a TM spec. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do is to solicit feedback throughout this talk. So feel free to interrupt me. You know, you know, that sort of happens at BoostCon anyway. We, you know, we're very interactive, but interrupt me at any point and say, hey, I just don't get this, or hey, this is really stupid. Um, anything that you want to share, any opinions you have, uh, we really want to have that dialogue. And I actually asked Hartman beforehand, he's going to be uh, the note taker to make sure any, any really good ideas that come out of this uh, aren't missed, since I would probably have a hard time comprehending the idea that you're trying to convey to me and actually jotting it down at the same time. So just know that Hartmut is, uh, is being delegated even more work, uh, so he's going to stay busy throughout this entire talk. So the outline is, uh, again, I'll go over the basics of transactional memory explain sort of the core concepts, and then we'll get into some examples. Then we'll talk a little bit about what the TM uh, C++ spec has achieved and things that we're hoping to do for future work. And then we'll really just open it up for audience participation. And, you know, if you're not comfortable with the setting of just sort of throwing something out here in, in this meeting, um, feel free to catch me offline. And, or you can email me. My email will be at the end. Uh, you can email me and say, hey, a, a really interesting idea that I don't think that TM spec actually captures right now is to do this and I promise that I will take that back to the C++ uh, TM specification uh, group. And thankfully, you know, I just joined the, the TM specification committee uh, several months ago, but thankfully I have two experts that are both on the committee uh, in the room. So if there's any question that I can't answer, I'm going to, to defer to Hans and Michael. So we'll uh, definitely uh, have it be very interactive. Uh, yeah, an audience discussion throughout. Okay, so before we can really dive into transactional memory, uh, a lot throughout this talk I'll be talking about th safety. I'll be saying things like, oh, this doesn't have any concurrency violations, or things are safe. And in order to understand what that means, you have to sort of have some sort of background on concurrency violations. So very quickly, I'll just give a brief uh, primer, primer about what these things are. So the first that we probably all know is a data race. A data race is simply that you have some sort of shared memory in a multi-threaded program where one thread is accessing this in an unsynchronized fashion, and the other thread is accessing it in potentially a synchronized or unsynchronized. But one of them is unsynchronized, and at least one of those accesses is a write. If they're all reads, there's no problem because the data they're going to see is always going to be consistent. Uh, so that's basically a data race, and, and bad things happen in racy programs. Um, atomicity violation is basically the programmer is intending for something to be atomic, uh, they're trying to do some atomic operation, but they accidentally get the, the behavior wrong. So a way to think about this is you may have a condition 
that uh, will cause some action. And so they synchronize on the condition, and they synchronize on the action, but they don't synchronize them together. And so because of that, there's another thread that can come in and change the state of the program after the condition has been checked, which then no, sort of violates uh, the, the, the resulting action. So that's an atomicity violation, and we'll, we'll see a concrete example of that shortly. Um, you also have order violations. An order violation is simply, the uh, uh, easiest way to think about an order violation is um, accessing an uninitialized un variable. So you could have one thread that's supposed to initialize a variable. You have another thread that's supposed to access that variable, and somehow the other thread accesses it before it gets initialized. That's an order violation. Um, next, you have a deadlock. We probably all know what deadlock is. You know, we have some cycle of resources that are being held by threads that prevent the program from making any forward progress. And then last, we have livelock. Livelock, in my opinion, is probably one of the hardest uh, concurrency violations to deal with because with livelock, you tend to think things are actually working, but you're actually making no forward progress. And the way I like to describe LiveLock is in terms of transactional memory. Some of the early non-blocking systems in TM, uh, they had LiveLock. They could exhibit LiveLock where two transactions would be executing, and they try to commit, and then they collide, and both of them would abort. And then they just retry and abort and retry and abort. So your program looks like it's making, work, it's making forward progress, but it's actually not making any forward progress. So. So now we have a, a basic overview of concurrency violations. So you can be thinking about these things when I say, oh, you know, th this TM um, module doesn't have any of these concurrency violations. Now you sort of know what I'm talking about. Okay, so TM in a nutshell. Basic overview of transactional memory is this. It's really an open-ended concurrency paradigm. And all of these bolded words I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to go through them sort of fast. Uh, the next thing with transactional memory is we use transactions as our synchronization mechanism. You can think of this as like mutual exclusion using locks. Transactional memory uses transactions in order to synchronize the code. Uh, and the transactions guarantee atomicity and isolation for the most part. There are cases when atomicity and isolation are relaxed, and that's when things tend to get a little bit more complicated and, and confusing. And we'll actually see some examples of that very shortly. So, um, so by open-ended, what I mean is that transactional memory, part of why transactional memory has received, I, in my opinion, a notable amount of research attention, is that it can be implemented under the hood in a variety of different ways. Uh, it can be implemented in an optimistic fashion, speculatively, uh, which basically means all transactions can execute concurrently. And then if there's a conflict, then some transactions are rolled back. Or you try to order things so you have some sort of serializable schedule, even if they do conflict. And which is actually, you know, if you look at database theory, there are certain ways that you can get away, you can get away with this if they're ordered very precisely. But you don't have to do it speculatively. You could do it pessimistically. You could basically say, okay, only one transaction executes at a time, and your system is pretty much going to be guaranteed to be correct. The problem is it could potentially be very slow because you're going to serialize all those transactions and, well, you might as well be running like a single threaded program at that point, right? Um, you could also implement TM using non-blocking uh, atomic primitives like uh, load link stored conditional, uh, CAS, DCAS, um, or you can do it lock-based. Most of the systems that I've built are lock-based under the hood. Uh, and so you, you have options. And then last but not least, <coughs> there are, of course, a number of things that you can do with op open-ended transactional memory. But one thing just to point out is there is actually research in distributed transactional memory, uh, not just on a single node, but on a cluster of machines. So uh, the way to think about TM is, you know, it's just it's sort of like this new concept that allows us to rethink the way that we've, we've done synchronization for uh, programs that involve uh, more than one flow of control. Control. Really, that's, that's some, one way to think about it. So very, very open-ended. Um, transactional memory uses transactions, and the transactions are essentially just a finite sequence of operations, uh, you know, very, just a, a block of code. And they usually have a begin, a commit, and then a cancel and abort. Now, this is not always the case. Uh, there are certain cases where these things may not actually be present. Um, in particular, the cancel and abort. We'll talk about that later, about how there are some transactions that actually cannot be aborted. Um, but a very quick example of what a transaction looks like uh, is something like this. 
Uh, this is actually a transaction from the C++ TM spec. You just say, hey, I want to add a transaction, and then you give it some scope, and then you can perform this uh, swap operation. Now, if uh, another transaction, and we, we assume here that uh, X and Y are shared variables. Um, if another transaction is executing concurrently that causes a conflict, uh, the transaction will potentially be rolled back and start again. Um, or the other transaction that's executing concurrently will be uh, rolled back and started again. The TM system under the hood is really managing who's going to be aborted or canceled. Uh, transactions uh, uh, ensure both atomicity and isolation. And again, this is just in general. Uh, so I know some of you are, you know, probably on like my last slide already, thinking, oh, I know these cases where you know they can be, you know, don't necessarily guarantee atomicity and isolation. And you're right, and we'll eventually get to that. But for the general case, they ensure atomicity and isolation. When I say atomicity, I mean all or nothing. And when I say isolation, I mean that the transactions are, uh, the operations inside the transactions are invisible with respect to other transactions. Uh, and that's very important. It's very important to, to distinguish, at least within the C++ TM specification, is that the transaction execution is isolated with respect to other transactions. Not necessarily all the other operations that are executing, uh, potentially in a racy program. Uh, so if you have races and you're doing sort of bad things, those uh, you may be able to see, uh, you know, Weird things, uh, but you know, as as Hans would, Hans would point out, you know, there's no benign data races, and you should just shouldn't have races in your programs. So if we go back to our swap code, uh, the way to look at this is that uh, this state here, where we're setting x equal to y, so now both x and y are, are one. Uh, this state would be invisible with regard to the other transactions, and this this will become important on why this state needs to be invisible in, in just a moment if you aren't already there. And then finally, this entire block of code, this is the atomic code here. So when the transaction begins, none of these operations happen. And when the transaction finishes, all of these operations have happened. And so it's this all or nothing type of thing. OK, and, and last but not least, composition is Oh, I don't think I mentioned that on the prior slide. Composition is probably one of the most important characteristics of transactional memory. Part of the reason why I think uh, so many people are interested in transactional memory, aside from its open-endedness, is that transactions can compose. And this is something that is difficult to achieve uh, with locks. And so I think that the best way to demonstrate composition is to look at it from something that doesn't compose natively uh, or without special effort. And so we could just take this very simple example, which some of you have probably already seen, where we have an account. And uh, we're simply doing a lock-based implementation, withdrawing money, depositing money. Uh, the locks are inside of these uh, interfaces. And uh, we, you know, we have a balance. I wanted to put it down here, but it's just too much code, so I put it off to the side. Uh, and then we, we want to implement something a little bit more advanced. So we implement our transfer and a balance check. So we have two counts, our checkings and our savings. And we want to transfer money from checking into savings. And someone else also wants to check the balance of both of these things at the same time. Uh, if we, if we assume an initial state of the checking has $100 in it and savings has nothing in it, really we can imagine if we're performing this transfer operation, there are really only two valid states for this program, right? The first valid state is where nothing has happened. We have $100 in checking, we have zeros in savings. And the second initial, the, the, the final state is that we have zero money in checking and we have 100 in savings. Any other state is, is, doesn't really exist, right? I mean. It shouldn't be possible, but if we look at how this could execute in a multi-thread program using the lock infrastructure that we already built, you could easily get this behavior. Where thread 1 executes and it performs its withdraw, and then thread 2 performs the check on the balance and sees that you have no money in either of these accounts, and suddenly now you've bounced all of your checks. And so no more visits to Best Buy for you, right? This, this would be a bad thing. So, so locks don't compose without special effort. This is really what we're saying here. Um, and, and I'll get back to that. So 
don't be offended if you, oh, we can do things with locks. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. So now, if we look at composition with transactions, <coughs> we basically repeat, oh, if I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, transactions can be combined. You can take many small transactions and make them into a bigger transaction, and the big transaction remains isolated and atomic. And so to demonstrate this, we have uh, our withdraw and our deposit transactions uh, and our balance. Notice I haven't changed the uh, implementation details at all. Uh, I'm not uh, you know, cheating with transactions by exposing something that I didn't do with locks. It's basically the same thing. The transaction is still inside of the interface. Uh, it's not on the outside. And then I write these two operations, uh, the transfer and the balance. And then suddenly, lo and behold, if we try this again, we get the right behavior. And the only possible behaviors, no matter when Thread2 is running its balance check, is for it to see uh, $100 in checking, zero in savings, or zero in checking, and 100 in savings. It's not possible for it to see this intermediate state right here. Dave? Could you uh, back up a couple of steps? Yeah. So where, where's the where's the guy checking the balances? Is that all in a transaction too? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so let's talk about that. I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. So you guys are really thinking this is fantastic. So I I, I did sort of cheat, right? I I added transactions here, and I didn't do that with locks. Okay. So that's not totally fair. We um. We, we need to try this again to be fair to locks. Okay, so we do this now with locks. And now we get, uh, we effectively get composition. We uh, perform our lock here and our lock here on checking and savings. And now if we rerun the same program, uh, and as long as balance is done the same way, uh, we basically get the, we get the same composable behavior. The problem with this is, notice there's a couple of things that are slightly different, okay? First of all, we have to expose the lock interface. We didn't have to do that with transactional memory uh, because there really is no interface to expose. Um, the second thing is, oh, yeah, so it exposed the implementation. The second thing to note is that um, it, this can potentially deadlock. It's very easy to deadlock this. Uh, all I have to do is take some sort of junior programmer that comes in and says, well, I want to write my transfer function that does, you know, puts money into savings first and then checking or, you know, doesn't follow the sequential locking order. And suddenly we get a deadlock. And what's interesting about this is that you may say, oh, yeah, but look, this is so obvious, right? Not so obvious. Um, a lot of these really, really complicated deadlock scenarios are like the one in a million execution deadlocks. You know, they're the ones that, you know, all the simple deadlocks you've already fixed. And then you deploy to your customer, myself included, and suddenly, you know, after, you know, it's been out there for a couple months, someone says, hey, I've got this deadlock, and you have no idea why it's happening. Uh, in fact, you know, it's exactly, I had a very similar bug like this in TBoost STM. You know, so it's very, very easy to get these, as soon as you start exposing these locks, very easy to get these deadlocks that become extremely difficult to track down. Um, and then last but not least, uh, one thing to also point out is that if you, if you start composing with locks, essentially what's going to happen is you're going to degrade to coarse grain locking. This will happen. No matter how good your efforts are to keep things fine grain, if you compose, if you try to build bigger and bigger operations, what's going to happen is that you're going to have to acquire all of those locks in order to do this operation. And that's basically going to mean that any other thread that's trying to perform any operations with even one of those locks is going to be stalled. And so essentially, you know, essentially you're creating this, you know, the big coarse grain, coarse grain lock. Um, I think they, uh, in the Linux kernel, it's called the big kernel lock or something. I think they, they, they finally did away with it and, and with some serious effort. But, uh, you know, just to make the point that even these, these experts that are writing OS code, you know, we, we can degrade to this um, even if we have the best intentions. So, okay, so now, now we understand the basics of TM. We understand atomicity, isolation, composition. Now we can get on to more interesting things. <coughs> So let's look at some examples with, oh, yes, sir. Why don't we degrade the coarse grain transactions when we compose transactions? That's a fascinating question. And I'm actually going to answer that in, um, I think, like three slides. 
Yeah, so excellent. And if I don't, I actually, when I get to that slide, I'll come back to you and say, does this make sense? Okay. Um, Okay, so, so let's look at the C++ spec. So, so we've seen what, what a basic transaction is. Now we're going to talk about stuff that um, I personally have found interesting. Now, keep in mind that with the C++ TM spec I just joined, this is a group of people that have been working on this for several years, and I've been building TBoost STM. So, you know, I don't really understand exactly what's going on, and I'm reading through the spec, and I'm finding things that are, you know, somewhat interesting to me. In particular, interesting problems that they've been able to solve that maybe I haven't been able to solve with TBoost STM. So the first one that jumps out to me is this problem. So <coughs> it's relatively straightforward. We have an ID class that is, you know, const correct. Whatever your opinions are about const correctness, you know, let's keep those off to the side. But, uh, you know, there, you have an ID here that's not supposed to change. And uh, we have an implementation of this ID that derives from it and basically creates a monotonically increasing ID value. So no, no two instances of our account should have the same ID. Pretty straightforward, right? In a single-threaded program, this works perfectly. And as soon as you port this to a multi-thread program, things start to go really bad. And we all probably see why, right? It's this shared variable here that can potentially be accessed uh, by multiple threads simultaneously, and now we can get multiple ID, multiple uh, accounts with the same ID. But there's a very important problem that's happening with, with this particular case. This ID up here is constant, okay? So we have to initialize it in the member initialization list. We have to pass it up this way. And even if, you know, some of you have been saying, oh, well, you can pull const down into here. Even if you did pull const down into this derived class, you still have to initialize it in the member initialization list. Um, and th this extends beyond just constness. You know, if you have references, the same thing applies, right? So we have to figure this out. We can't move this problem into here. Uh, TBoost STM can't handle this. Just can't do it. I've tried. I've really tried. And there, you know, you could, you could, with TWIST STM, for those of you that are familiar with it, you could potentially construct, if you created uh, a transaction object it, it, as a member, and then you initialized it here, you could begin a transaction, and then have the order of the member initialization list follow. But the problem is, if, if it aborted, then there's no way for it to unwind. Okay, so with TBoost STM, it's just, you it's just can't handle this. Um, with the C++ TM spec, you can. And it, it's so simple. You just say, hey, I want a transaction, and I want it just around the member initialization list. Can you put it on an individual member? I don't believe you can. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. The question was, um, can you put the transaction on an individual member for the member initialization list? Hans, Mike, do you guys know if you can do that? I, um, no, that's not what the design was for. You mean to try to put it as, a, as part of, like, 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 on a member, like, up there? I just um, like, well, say there were two members, IB right. and, and... And you just want to put it on just this one, not the second one. Right. Yeah. The initializer in the initializer list. Oh, I see. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but there's provision there to make, if it's a list, uh, I thought I saw hmm. something like that. I have to look it up. <coughs> yeah, yeah. This looks like it just mirrors the syntax for function, tr function try blocks in that case. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Based on the try so in that case, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Because the syntax of function try blocks does not allow this. It. allow, yeah, it's exactly the same as that. It's based on the function try block. Uh, mm -hmm. Semantics yeah. is yeah. useful for something. Yeah. 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 So so keep in mind, like <clears throat> when I first saw this, I really was I really was wow. And this is me working in TM for the last seven years or so. And I saw this and I thought, okay, these guys have really thought about this. I didn't come up with this idea. They came up with it before I showed up. And the reason why I think that this is so cool is that we're always trying to build extremely optimized code, right? This is like what we do. We want to write the most efficient code that we can. And so I use member initialization lists all the time, whenever I can. In particular, I might use member initialization lists to do memory allocation, right? And we're all used to building our own little memory allocators, right? We've all probably done that. And with transactional memory, uh, with this implementation, 
you can create a transaction for your memory allocation, and if there's a conflict, it will allow you know it'll it'll roll itself back. Now, I pose the question for you to try to do this with STD mutex or you know pthread lock or something like pthread mutex. Okay, so now now before I go on, I have to say you're all very smart, right? It can be done. All right, I know that if I pose this and you know we end the conversation. Three minutes after I get done, Dave will come to me, oh, dude, here's the solution. Okay, so yes, it can be done. And in fact, I actually do it with uh, T-Boost STM. But the problem is, and this goes back to your question that, about why things with TM don't necessarily degrade to coarse grain, is that if you use locks, it necessarily creates a serialization point. It has to, because that's how mutual exclusion works. With transactional memory, it doesn't. So think about this for a second, and think about this like really deeply. Don't think about the code. Think about your implementation of this memory, um, memory management system. You can build your memory management system so it's highly distributed, right? So if multiple threads were to go in and access it, they go down in, in potentially def different branches, you know, different areas of some tree or some linked list or something, where when they're performing writes on this thing, they're not colliding. If you do that with transactional memory, you can have potentially substantial concurrent throughput that you would not be able to achieve if you use locks. Locks are going to order these things serially. Transactions are only going to serialize them if there's a conflict between the memory operations. Specifically if there's so someone is writing to something and someone else is reading this thing or someone else is also writing to it. But if they're separate, they're in separate areas, the TM system is smart enough to say, hey, look, these things can happen concurrently. I, I don't need to roll anything back. So the potential here, at least you know, from the way that I was thinking about it when I first saw it, is this is really awesome, is that we can, we can do highly optimized code and we can make it potentially very parallel. Yes, sir? So what happens to the object if the uh, transaction is rolled back? I mean, is it uh, ever constructed? Or? So that, that's a fascinating question. Um, yeah, so, um, so uh, the answer to that is, is not totally straightforward, at least, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, the question is, uh, what happens with the object if the transaction is rolled back? So let's say that this, uh, this allocation happens, and then we realize that there's a conflict, and then one of the, one of the allocations has to be rolled back. What happens? Um, in, in essence, the, the object is like deleted. Okay, but that's sort of an oversimplification. I think a lot of the, the, the hardcore TM people in the committee would probably say, well, actually, you could view it like the object never actually was constructed. And I think that that might be the more appropriate answer in this case. Is that, does that jive with you, Hans? Yeah. Okay. Sebastian. Can the transaction be, transaction be repeated so that if, if, if the transaction is rolled back, it starts over and does another try at initializing the object? That's right. That's exactly what will happen. Yeah, that's exactly what will happen. So if, if, if this is not entirely clear, if there is a conflict, it will be rolled back, and then that, that whatever construction, um, sorry, I'll repeat what Sebastian said, um, is that you know, you're going to continue to retry this until the transaction succeeds. So even if uh, it is rolled back, um, that, that object you know, that never existed will be deleted, or it just never existed, and then eventually it will exist. Well, that, I mean, that would have to terminate at some point, because if, it, if you the transaction kept failing, then you'd never get out of that loop, right? Uh, potentially. Um, yeah, so, so what you're getting onto is you, you've got some sort of live lock. Um, and that live lock would happen if, uh, okay, so underneath the hood in, in a lot of these TM systems are these things called contention managers. And the way contention managers work is what we realized early on with transactional memory is we need two separate things. We need correctness and we need forward progress and we need them to be separate. Um, contention managers handle the forward progress. The TM systems handle the correctness. So a TM system will say, look, in order to be correct, I can only allow one of these two transactions to commit. And then it'll hand it off to the contention manager and then the contention manager will say, which one should commit? And so essentially any relatively intelligent contention manager would not allow one transaction to be aborted indefinitely. At some point, the priority of that transaction would become the highest of any that's executing and uh, that transaction would commit. So fascinating question though. Yes, sir. Uh, what happens with um, side effects of the constructor? Okay. 
Uh, so the, the question is, what happens with the side effects of the constructor? In this particular case, the transaction here is actually just for the member initial initialization list. It's not actually for the constructor itself. And so uh, the transaction, okay, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's actually how it works. So if it parallels function try blocks, it would be for the body too. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Sure, hope that's how it is. Okay, I'm not. Uh, uh, well, well, even, regardless, you may have an initializer that is it calling a constructor. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that okay. That that's that's a uh, that's a valid point. Um, Side effects. Although. Memory handles that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's um, the the uh, basically I think that the the side effects would be the same as the side effects that you would have from allocating this and then needing to deallocate it. Um, so I'll have to look into that in more detail to figure out what the correct semantics are on that. Hans, do you know? It's, I, I'm looking at the text here. It's, 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 uh, it says specifies that the function's body, and in the case of constructors, all member and base class initializes and execute inside a transaction. So it's the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Nobody could hear that on the tape. Okay, um, so so effectively, it's uh, for the member initialization list. It's the entire um, initialization list, and it's all of the base classes, uh, constructors, and, uh, initializer lists, and the body, and and the body. Uh, yeah. So, in other words, if if some member, um, some member's constructor has a side effect, oh, okay, and the, the, it's destructor is then so the side effect happens. And then the destructor. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're, we're having a discussion. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I repeat so everyone on the video can hear this. So the side effect is potentially happening is what you're saying, and then the destructor will ha handle it. Not necessarily, although I, I think I see sort of where you're going. But Sebastian, do you have something to add? So the point is, I mean, what kind of side effect? There are side effects that are really tricky in transactions like I.O. Yes. That's a whole different topic. Exactly. That exactly. And I am going to get to that. And actually, that's where I thought you were going. And is sorry. Um, regarding construction of sub-objects, if the transaction is rolled back, I don't think the destructors are called, but the transaction is rolled back. It's as if the constructors had never been executed. That's exactly right. Yeah, that is my understanding. And to repeat what Sebastian said, it's, it's as if the constructor never happened. And so, you know, for like T-Boost STM, effectively what happens is that, yeah, it would, a constructor fails and then the destructor would be invoked. But with the C++ TM spec, the way that um, it's specified is it's as if the constructor was never called. So, and you can run into some really weird cases where you can have side effects, in particular with I.O. or, you know, you're doing anything in the network or writing to a file, that type of thing. And then you use special types of transactions in those cases. I think that that's probably what you're getting to. Um, you're thinking really far ahead, and, and that's, that's fantastic. I will talk about that uh, shortly. Yeah, so, so that's an excellent question. Um, so, but anyway, so, so the idea here really is just to sort of get your head around the fact that with TM, uh, you know, you can have potentially very wide concurrency as long as the underlying algorithm permits that. Yes, sir? Uh, whether this is an optimization, as far as I understand, um, depends really on how expensive the operation is. You should, if you need to roll it back and you need to retry it again, and it costs a lot of time, it may be more reasonable to use standard mutex. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so his point, uh, to repeat that, is that there, uh, really, what you need to understand is how transactional memory works. Uh, you need to understand when it makes sense to use it and when it doesn't make sense to use it. And in this particular case, what he's pointing out is that if, um, if your overhead of rollback is going to be relatively high and your collision rate is also going to be relatively high, it may actually make sense to use some sort of mutual exclusion. And I think that that's probably a very accurate assessment. Uh, if you know that your, your, uh, you know, the collision rate is going to be relatively low and the overhead of the rollback is going to be high, you can still potentially go, you know, go f with a transactional memory solution, knowing that collisions will be relatively low. Um, and vice versa, you know, if the collision rate is somewhat high, you know, maybe 70% or something, that's probably still too high, um, but the, the unrolling overhead is relatively low, uh, TM may still be the way to go. But if both of those things are, are high, you know, it, it probably does make sense for you to do something like mutual exclusion. So, yeah, excellent point. 
And, and, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more about understanding TM, not just uh, on the surface, but understanding exactly uh, how to deal with these things like these side effects and understanding um, the rollback behavior. Uh, one other example that I'd like to quickly go over is this example that I think is, is relatively simple. Uh, what we have here is uh, an object uh, that is being set to you know, the, this, the expression from these three shared variables, uh, x, y, and z. And we don't know what object is. Object could be anything. Um, and again, in a, a sequential program, serial pro single-threaded, this works just fine. But as soon as we make it multi-threaded, we need to synchronize uh, the access here. So the question is, how do we make this safe using transactional memory? Uh, so the way I like to describe this is, first, how we would do this using TBoost STM. With TBoost STM, uh, one way that you do this is you do something like this. You'd say, hey, I, I want this entire section here uh, to be inside of a transaction. And uh, the, the access to the shared variables is here. Um, all the access to the temp is still wrapped inside of the transactions, which may not be necessary, uh, but okay, you know, this works. Uh, but it potentially is you know, a long running transaction and it could cost you performance. So it, it's, a, it's a suitable answer, but we may be able to do better. Uh, another way to do this is like this. Uh, really, and keep in mind, we really just need to synchronize the access here. We don't need to synchronize any of this. So we can make the transaction a little bit shorter um, and then you know, access our, our temp down here. And, and this also works. You know, but it you know, potentially changes the behavior slightly. Uh, you know, as many of us know, a uh, compiler is allowed to be able to like, uh, um, uh, perform the copy constructor here rather than operator equals if this is the assignment is done on the same line uh, the declaration is done on the same line as the assignment uh, and so you know it's potentially changing the behavior probably not a big deal uh, but if object is big then this you know this this potentially has a, a notable performance penalty you know so uh, you know maybe I'm nitpicking but you know this is still uh, it's not exactly what we want. So try again and we make it now a little bit faster uh, potentially is that now we just do heap allocation for this. Uh, we do new and we delete it down here. Yeah, I should initialize that to nuller. Um, but uh, the problem here is that you know our heap allocation and deallocation may be slow. And so the problem is with TBoost STM any way that I potentially slice it uh, you know and, and, and when we're talking about multi-thread programs when we're doing heap allocation and deallocation you know we're talking about serialization here right you know we need to in some way uh, uh, well based on how your your allocation is implemented um, but the problem here is that you know every way we slice this with TBoost STM we sort of get into this crux of uh, not being able to do it the way that we want it to do yes sir what about using optional Optional. I'm not familiar with optional. So Sebastian. The basic idea is that you allocate the space on the stack. Okay. And you do a placement new inside the transaction. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. That sounds like that would probably work. Uh, but that's not where I'm going with this example. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's an excellent solution. Uh, so what, the reason why actually I show this example is to demonstrate transaction expressions, and thank you for that. Uh, transaction expressions effectively get us uh, really just what we want, is the transaction wraps just the expression over here. This is all that it wraps. And what's really nice about this, uh, from you know purely like an aesthetic standpoint, is it, you know it relatively mirrors the original code. Uh, there's really you know almost no changes. Yes, sir. Um, can I ask a question about cost at this point? Is, mm. um, if this is, is running in a single-threaded environment, is there any does is, does the compiler eliminate the cost of transaction? That is an excellent question. And so uh, Beeman's question was, if this is running in a single threaded environment, uh, is there any performance penalty of having the transaction knowing that we don't really need the transaction? And the honest answer to that is I don't know. I would say that that's probably implementation specific. Uh, uh, Hans, do you want to take a stab? Uh, Michael? I don't do implementations. I mean, it, it, 
Oh, the, uh, uh, the question again is, if this is running in a single thread environment, is the compiler smart enough a way to basically eliminate this transaction because it's unnecessary? So then there won't be any performance penalty. Um, not, in gen not in general. The, 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 the cost of setting up the, the, the contention manager and the conflict detection mechanism yeah. would, still, would, still be, would still be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like this thing just goes back through and there's no possibility of colliding with anything else. Yeah, um, but that's an excellent question. And, and um, Hartmut, can you make sure that's down? I'll take that back to Intel and I'll ask them what their implementation is and then I'll get back to you on that. And the general problem with all such issues are if you try to optimize this, you have to essentially optimize it at compile time, but at compile time you don't know whether you're going to be talking about this other application. Right, that's exactly... Right, yeah, and so Han's point for the, for the camera is that um, at compile time, we don't necessarily know if this is going to be a multi-threaded or single-threaded application, and so we may not have the opportunity to be able to optimize this away. So, yeah, excellent, excellent point, and, and great feedback in general. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is exactly what we want, um, and, and let me just show this one quick thing, and then we'll get to your question. And then notice that the assignment is done outside of the transaction. So, and this is, this is really key, because all we really care about is the access to the shared variables. The actual assignment to this temporary is, uh, you know, this is outside of what the access to the shared variables is, so we don't need that to be synchronized. So this is a nice... Uh, you know, performance optimization. But what you may be asking yourself right now are about temporaries. And you may be saying, okay, yeah, you can do that, Justin, but I'm pretty familiar with C++ and I know a thing or two about temporaries and I know that if I implement it like this, I'm gonna have fewer temporaries and this code's actually gonna be faster. So I have two counter arguments to that argument and those two points are this, programmability I think this is, you know, I think this is easier to read than this is. And, you know, I know most of you are experts in C++ in the room. And in the past, we've written this. And then it's really frustrating, right, because some junior programmer will come around and be like, why are there three long, I can do this in one. And then they shrink it back down and suddenly, you know, here's why and there's these temporaries, blah, blah. We have our value references now, or we will. This solves this problem, at least to my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong, any of you guys that are super experts. Um, my experience has been that our value references are perfectly uh, suitable solution to get rid of these temporaries. And so if you implement our value references in your operators, you get basically the same number of temporaries you get here, and now the code is uh, as readable as it was initially. So, uh, Sebastian, did you have a question? Can you go back? Yeah. Uh, stop. So, what if, if, what if that's not what I want? Mm. Because, because, so example, I say, okay, I don't need X anymore after that, and I say, I wrap the X in the standard move, so the whole expression could, could evaluate inside the memory that X manages, and then the, I get a move construction for temp, from the, re from the resulting R value reference of the total expression. Okay. Which means that X is accessed inside the move construction. I see, I see. Okay, okay, so Sebastian's question is, what if I don't want the assignment to be out of the transaction? Because I'm gonna use move semantics and I'm effectively gonna transfer the uh, ownership of the object over to this temporary and this guy's no longer gonna have it in its state. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I would say in this particular case, and Hans and Michael, you know, let me know if you're wrong. I, I would say that this probably would not be the right solution then for that problem. I think that you'd probably revert back to optional. Optional. <laughs> you'd revert back to optional. Yeah. Um, something that is not your transaction expressions. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand why that's a problem. Um, the, if you add the move, you're, you're changing this into a mutating operation on X. Yes. Okay. So, but, but that's still transactional. So what's the, what's the problem? The problem is that the final mutation of X happens inside the move constructor. Outside of the transaction, right. Outside the transaction. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think Sebastian's right that the problem is that... Uh, if, I, if I wrap X instead of move, no, what no, 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 no. The final, the final mutation of the memory that X is occupying, yes. yes. But the final mutation of the object X, no. So this com comes down to how smart the how smart the compiler is about <coughs> dealing with objects as opposed to their, <coughs> as opposed to the memory that it has allocated for them. 
I don't get it. Well, the the result of that expression yeah. is going to pop out by value, right? No, it's going to pop out by R value reference. No, you know, you don't return an R value reference from a from a divide operation. If the input is an R value reference, I would do that. Yeah. Standard strings plus operator with a left yeah. side is an R value <coughs> reference returns an R value reference. So, guys, I think this is a fascinating topic. We should, we should, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 this is interesting, actually, and maybe all three of us should talk about this offline, because I would like to know the answer, but, yeah, for the time being, let's, let's move on, um, and then we can use the whiteboard afterward. Okay, so temporaries, uh, okay, so now uh, I.O., okay, so things with side effects that can't necessarily be rolled back. Uh, so, um, Let's do I.O. with no synchronization to start out. We have uh, hello concurrent programming world and two threads call this. There's no synchronization at all. And the super newbie programmer gets this and says, ha, huh, you know, parallel programming is so easy. You know, what's, what's the big deal? And then, uh, and then they run it again and then they get this. And then after a million times they get this, which is really now they know. <laughs> They're into it. Okay, now they understand what we all understand. This is possible too, okay? It is possible. You can work it out. Um, so, so now we do I.O. with transactions. And we, uh, we have I.O. and it's going to have side effects. And so we're going to get into some interesting problems. We have these two transactions. And they're both calling foo. And we get something like this. And now it's even more interesting, right? Because in the other case, where we had no synchronization, we could be like, oh, we could work that out in our head. But in this case, we've got like two transactions, and suddenly we have three hellos, and we're scratching our head saying, how the heck is that even possible? But now we all know. The reason why this is, is that we have these side effects. These transactions, w these transactions are going to conflict. One of them is going to be rolled back, and it's going to try again, and then we're going to get this, you know, we may get, who knows how many hellos we're going to get. So this is not how you do I.O. or um, irrevocable actions in uh, transactional memory with the spec. The way you do that is you use relaxed transactions. and. Relaxed transactions are very simple. You just add the attribute relaxed to the transaction, and then suddenly it gives you the correct answer. The way this works essentially <clears throat> is the, uh, it basically uses what, what uh, the TM community calls single global lock semantics. And essentially it makes the transaction isolated. So no other transaction can run concurrently while this transaction is running. And so it, it ensures that if there's any interference from other transaction, this is not going to happen. And so this guy will execute and print this out. And then this guy will execute and then print this out. Keep in mind that this also works for any other transactions that are also not relaxed. So it ensures that there won't be any conflict between any um, concurrently run transactions. So at this point, <clears throat> We can go back to our original lock base code. We can go to our account problem and say, okay, now I have this guy, and now I can basically make this thing, this uh, lock base legacy code, work with transactions. Uh, and that's sort of right, but not completely. It will work in the sense that you won't have interference with other transactions. That's correct. But you can still have interference from other locks. Uh, and that's because this lock will be acquired, the checking lock will be acquired with, with, for the withdraw, and then it'll be released. And then um, at this point, another thread can do the balance operation and then get between these two operations. So essentially, um, if you want to have lock based uh, legacy code work with C TM spec based on what we have right now, uh, what you really need to do is this is you need to have. Uh, if you want your, if you want composition, you want it to be atomic, and you don't want interference from either locks or transactions, you essentially have to do this. You need to make the transaction relaxed, and you still need to acquire your locks. Yes, sir. How's a relaxed transaction any different than a really coarse-grained lock? So serializing everything. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how is a relaxed transaction different from a coarse grain lock? Uh, there's no difference. 
Uh, at least in my understanding, it's, it's basically exactly as you described it. It's a coarse grain lock that ensures that you get like serial behavior. Hans, do you have something to add to that? I disagree with that a little bit. Okay. Because, uh, you can use uh, relaxed transactions in cases in which it's unlikely that you're actually going to acquire lock. So you need to acquire lock on an error path to deal with the error handling or something like that. In which case, uh, the, the transaction, at least depending on the implementation, the, you can continue to use the transactionals, the whole back-based implementation, unless until the point at which you actually decide that you need to acquire the lock, at which point you do need to do you do need to serialize everything. But that means the fast path can still be fast. You only it's only the error path that has to actually be serialized. Oh, interesting. Okay, and, and so basically what, what Hans, if I try to summarize just for the recording, what Hans basically said is that there's another case for, uh, another way to think about relaxed transactions is actually a little bit better than coarse grain lock, is that um, if you don't acquire a lock in uh, like a fast path, the lock is only acquired on an error handling path, then the execution will be like a normal transaction um, in the sense that uh, it won't perform the single global lock semantics and, and it will be able to execute uh, it concurrently with other is that should still be able to execute concurrently. I think some of the uh, some of the Intel implementation papers presented implementations that do that. I don't know what the the actual okay does, okay yeah yes sir. So uh, say you your I/O operation was to write to a buffer mm -hmm. on some device that's mapped to your memory. Would I mean would you need to do a relaxed transaction in that case because you're still writing to <coughs> you know, what looks like conventional memory? Um, so the question is, uh, if would you still need to use a relaxed transaction if you're uh, writing from some high level, uh, writing some high level data into a low level buffer? Is that right? Um, that's mapped to like that's a conventional memory segment. Yeah. A memory, memory mapped I.O. Okay, memory mapped I.O. And the answer to that, is, Hans, do you? I, I, not necessarily, I mean, it sort of depends. I mean, you can implement I.O. in such a way that it can be rolled back to a point, right, by, by buffering, essentially. And at that point, I.O. is no longer in a revocable action because you can revoke, you can abort it. And at that point, yeah. you, can, you, you can do I.O. Uh, inside an atomic transaction. Yeah. Okay, so, so the Hans' answer is essentially that it may be possible to do this in just a normal transaction without it being relaxed. Yeah. So, um, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I assume it's possible to give these transactions names? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, no, I'm seeing no from both of my committee members. Um, Michael, do you want to add to that? No, I actually wanted to explore this question a little more, but I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. We, we we actually talked about adding names in an extension. But okay. And for the video, the question was, sorry, uh, can you add names to transactions? And the answer we, we all believe is no. Uh, and Michael, do you want to address? You brought up an interesting, because I thought about this. We, we kind of all thought about this, too. I mean, in a, in a, in a coarse grain log case, it, I think it does limit concurrency. And that, that alone adds, you know, reduces scalability. Because you can have two threads accessing um, disjoint um, table elements, let's say, in a coarse grain log. In your case, with the relaxed, in the relaxed transaction there, where they're both relaxed, mm -hmm. um, it is true that, that, that only one of them goes through, and the other one can go through later on so that you can end up with two hellos and not three. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm just guessing what happens there is that the other thread that's, and I may be wrong, if the other relaxed, because you can't actually have two relaxed transactions at the same time. Right. So the, the answer <laughs> to that question is, why is it that in your case it works? And I assume the answer is, one of them gets delayed mm -hmm. by a contention manager just so that one of them, the, the other one gets through, and then, and then the, the second relaxed transaction can now also go through. But the, the relaxed transactions are not blocking the regular transactions. They, that's right, they're not blocking. Whereas the other, whereas close grain hmm. ones, you are blocking. Right. That's, okay. I think, is the key difference. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. It's, it's, a, it's a subtle trick they're doing with the transaction map, the, the contention manager, where they're just holding back the other thread a little bit. I mean, a dumb one would probably just collide and said, oh, kill the other one. Okay. Okay, great. Um, oh, question. Uh, Dave, question. So is it as though uh, a relaxed transaction, like there's one special memory location that every relaxed transaction contends for? So that they're, they're all, uh, 
uh, mutually excluded. I see. Uh, regular <coughs> transactions can proceed. Is that is that a mental model that that actually yeah. accurate? Uh, so a relaxed uh, transaction give, doesn't give you isolation either from a particular memory. Uh, if someone else is writing to it, to a non-transaction, you can still get a raise. But the memory model... So, so are you asking like if you have multiple um, isolated transactions, are they all vying for a particular piece of memory so that they are serialized? No. Uh, okay. I, I, my intuition is actually a bit different, and this is dangerous because this is all very implementation dependent, and I haven't worked on any of these implementations. Yeah. Uh, but my model is that relaxed transactions begin executing basically the same way as atomic transactions. So that uh, basically uh, relaxed transactions give you the possibility of making them irrevocable at some point if, you, in fact, you execute some irrevocable action during the relaxed, relaxed transaction. So relaxed, right. Okay. Right. Relaxed uh, transactions are, in some sense, strictly a generalization, except that you can't abort inside a relaxed transaction because you might have become irrevocable before you did the abort. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah. And in tboost STM, that's actually how I've implemented it. Um, is that the transaction? Um, I think I actually talk about this in just a second. Um, uh, let's skip past this for a second. Uh, this is not totally accurate. Um, now based on the extra information we have from Hans and Michael. Um, they can execute in a serial fashion, but they may not. They, they can degrade performance, um, these, these relaxed transactions. Uh, but one thing we do want to ask is, you know, is there, does it doesn't make sense where, uh, right now, relaxed transactions are not the default. Uh, the atomic transactions are, transactions that um, have failure atomicity and uh, have isolation from other transactions. But um, maybe there are use cases, there are certain scenarios where relaxed transactions should be the default. And if there are cases, uh, you know, let us know. Yes, sir? Can you nest inside a relaxed transaction another transaction that's not relaxed? Uh, I believe that you can do that, but you cannot do the inverse of that. Yeah. You, so, oh, so his question, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, can you uh, embed a transaction inside of a relaxed transaction? And I believe the specification says you can do that, but you can't do the inverse of that. You can't have a transaction embed a relaxed transaction inside of it. Um, yeah. And so, um, just real quickly to continue on this discussion, uh, with TBoost STM, effectively, TBoost STM had the same behavior that we just described as far as if you have a normal atomic transaction, as soon as you get to a, um, uh, a lock acquisition operation, then the transaction would become isolated. Any action prior to that uh, would allow the transaction to continue to roll back. So I think that the way that TBoost STM implemented this is, is similar to like sort of the, the high level implement, um, view that you can have with relaxed transactions for the TM spec. Um, so one of the points here, the point of this slide is uh, we, we um, with the, the uh, if we go back just just uh, a slide here, we see that with relaxed transactions, we still have to acquire these locks in order to get atomicity with respect to transactions and locks. Um, and then some of you that may be familiar with TBoost STM may be asking yourself, you know, couldn't we already do this with TBoost STM without actually acquiring the locks? And we could. You basically get atomicity with respect to transactions and locks um, without actually acquiring the locks. Uh, but the way this works is you have to pass information about the locks that will be acquired inside of the transaction. And so the reason why, one of the things is, you know, I just joined the spec, so, um, you you know, Hans and Tatiana and I are actually talking about this, but um, one of the reasons why this is not implemented in the spec is it doesn't generalize very well. Um, as you can imagine, if you're trying to uh, create uh, atomicity for all these different types of synchronization mechanisms, you need to have some sort of uh, message passing for all the different uh, types of synchronizations that you're going to try to create atomic. And so the general solution here uh, that I have, or the solution I have here, just it doesn't generalize very well. So what what I'm proposing and what um, Tatiana and Hans and I have been talking about is potentially this new type of TM lock that might allow you, you know, this is not in the spec, but it's something we're discussing, might allow you essentially um, atomicity and isolation with respect to transactions and locks without <clears throat> performing the lock operation beforehand. 
So essentially, what you would have is if we go back to this slide here, you would basically be able to eliminate both of these um, operations, and you would still have atomicity with respect to locks and transactions. But this is, you know, totally in a proposal stage. Um, it, it's possible that <clears throat> this doesn't make sense, and it, it won't go into the spec. But if there is a strong argument for this type of behavior, that we really want this, and you don't want to have to deal with this this overhead, then you should make that known to me, and I can take that back. Uh, take that back to the TM spec committee meetings. Okay, so let's skip forward here. Um, so <clears throat> as like the primary author of TBIS STM, some things that I'd like to quickly point out, differences between TBIS STM and the spec. Um, first of all, TBIS STM, even though I've been working on it for a reasonable amount of time, and I, you know, I understand TM relatively well, uh, it's limited to a small space. You know, there's certain problems that I just can't quite capture from a library interface, no matter how I try to hack it. And it's quite possible that you know, I don't understand the language well enough, but through my efforts, you know, certain cases like the member initialization list issue is very hard to wrap inside of a transaction. <clears throat> um, so it's limited to a smaller space, uh, whereas the, the C++ TM spec is not. Of course, you know, this is, this is like a language extension, um, compiler implementation. Uh, TBIS STM also has notable code bloat. We've tried to minimize that as much as possible, uh, but you know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, building it directly into the language, you know, it's, it's much nicer. You know, it, it has a really uh, very straightforward uh, interface from non the original code to transactional code. And then uh, last uh, but not least, a simple v behavior in TBIS STM is relatively complex. Things like returning from the middle of a transaction was really hard. Um, and, and as you start to think about TM, uh, as you all have been doing, you can probably imagine there's some complicated things you have to deal with if you do that type of thing. Uh, whereas with the C++ TM spec, uh, this type of behavior is not that complex. It's all handled under the hood. You don't have to deal with it from a programming interface. And so really the point of this is that there's many things that the TM spec handles very elegantly. And with that, I'd like to talk about a very interesting so well, what about exceptions? Uh, last year, we had this very interesting discussion about transactions only being able to throw scalar-based exceptions. You know, they can only throw integers. And this is a very valid concern, right? You know, you can't even do things like STD exception. But the point that I would like to make here is that that's only restricted when you're canceling or aborting transactions. So when the transaction is committing, and this is the default behavior when you throw an exception, at least based on the C++ spec right now, you can do this. And this is totally legal. You can throw any type of exception that you want. You're not prohibited in any way. Just to be clear, that what happens here is that all the operations of the transactions prior to this will be committed, and then that exception will propagate. So, but now let's take a step back. Let, let's say, why is this the case that we limit, uh, you know, exceptions to, to just integer-based exceptions when we're canceling or boarding? Really, it comes down to this. This is the problem that we have, and we need to figure out a solution for this. So what happens is we've got a transaction that's executing, and then we want to cancel this transaction, and we, you know, the programmer wants some information about the transaction inside of the exception. But the problem is, is that the way the uh, TM implementation is, is undefined from the specification. So all of this state here can be eliminated as soon as the transaction is canceled. But then the, the programmer then tries to access this state in the catch outside of the transaction, and you crash because that state no longer exists. So initially, this is why uh, we limit it to just our integer-based uh, exceptions. Yes, sir? So is the, the, are you saying that the construction of the exception is considered part of the transaction? Um, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would be. I, um, uh, OK, so uh, yeah, in this case, I think that that would be. I don't think that that has to be. Yeah, that, that sort of, I, I think that that's sort of uh, outside of the problem. But really what, what's happening here, okay, so you could, 
In, in some sense, the, the exception is getting trying to get some of the state of the transaction. That's really what the programmer is after here. And what we're saying is that this is not possible because the transaction will be canceled. So however it, this is actually implemented is uh, sort of uh, secondary. But this is, this is the problem that we're running into, is that this transaction will be undone. And so any state that you try to propagate outside of the transaction could potentially crash the program. I, I think this is wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I, I wasn't here last. Yeah, year. go for it. So, so I want you to back up a little bit. To last slide? No, no, you can stay right here. What I'm confused by is if you've got a transaction canceled and you're getting an exception, presumably after the transaction cancel occurs, the transaction will be reattempted. The the point is with it with a transaction, you're you're partway through the transaction, you find it. There's a collision. Hey, this transaction is not going to be complete. We're going to try it again. Right. Right? So you're in the middle of the transaction. The transaction's aborting. And you're throwing an exception. But the exception can't exist because the, the transaction is going to be reattempted. It cannot have any side effects. Mm -hmm. the exception propagating out of a transaction that didn't complete doesn't, doesn't compute. It doesn't, you're, you're violating your contract on on the transaction is going to be reattempted. Um, <coughs> so, so, okay, I, I that, guess I don't understand what cancel means. Though. Okay, so, so that's right. Um, so let, let's take a step back. Um, the normal behavior for a transaction without doing this transaction cancel at all is that if there's any conflict, there's any type of uh, uh, scenario where the transaction has to be retried is it's just handled automatically in, underneath the, the hood and the programmer doesn't say anything about that. In this particular case when we say transaction cancel it's my understanding that what happens is it forces the transaction to abort, it, abort itself. So it wants to unwind all of the operations inside of the transaction and it will not be retried. It will actually exit out of here and then jump down to here. So that's actually what we're specifying with this transaction cancel. And so, but, but, right, but, but your initial, the initial point that you made about how, you know, the transaction didn't really exist, it never really happened, this is exactly the problem that we're running into, is that that's basically the semantics here. The transaction didn't exist. So you're trying to propagate some information about a transaction that never happened outside of it, which is just not possible. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. First of all, what's the difference if you don't say transaction cancel, if you just throw out of it? Oh, yeah. And so let me back up. If you just throw outside of a transaction, the default behavior <coughs> of the C++ TM spec is to actually commit this transaction. All the operations that have executed up to this point will commit. And then it will throw uh, the exception outward. Now, um, now, now, to be totally fair, uh, I, I, you know, I just showed up on the C++ TM spec with uh, tboost STM. The behavior is opposite. With CBIS STM, when you threw an exception out of a transaction, it would abort the transaction. Okay, so, but the C++ team spec, they've done it differently. And, you know, it's very possible that this, there are some really good reasons for doing this. There may also be some very good reasons for doing the opposite of this. Um, but this is, this is the behavior right now. And, you know, this is, you know, this is still like version 1.0. Uh, we may have done the wrong thing, and, and we can have some discussion about changing it. Yes, sir. I think part of the problem in, in that whole discussion last year and, and probably again this year is is that the, it, we changed the name from atomic to transaction. And to me, transaction is a is a detail is an implementation detail for 99% of the time. And if this was called atomic and I threw inside of it, it would make complete sense. Okay, I atomically threw. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Right. But now that it's called transaction, everyone's like, oh, it, it does this magic rollback stuff. It's like, I didn't need to know that when it was called atomic. Right. It's just right. <clears throat> atomics really well. So, but now that I know that it's something that can roll back, now I expect throw to, to roll back because, well, of course, I'm... I'm, I'm right, right, right. And, things. Yeah. And, and so his point, just, just for the video, is that it it's basically relates to a nomenclature thing. Is that transactions, the, the thing we have in our head says transactions either, you know, do this, you know, they have this rollback behavior. And so when you throw something inside of it, um, it automatically just, just rolls itself back. And so the behavior is, you know, 
should be that this just magically vanishes. Whereas if this were called atomic, you know, everything up to this point is atomic and executed atomically, and then we throw, and then it, ma it makes more sense to us uh, in our mental picture. Um, uh, Dave, you've had your hand up for a while, so, and then I'll get to you. Well, I mean, do you, do you want to finish talking about history and have me move the room, or should I? Or should I? No, 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 yeah, G go at it. All right, all right, so there's... <coughs> There are two. Um, there are sort of two parallel things going on here. One is, uh, I, I think the evaluation about the semantics of the exception disappearing is wrong, and I can explain why. But, um, <clears throat> but before you get to that point, I wonder why the, what this looks like. This feature, this transaction cancel throw, looks like somebody who was implementing TM said, oh, we have this rollback behavior built in. What if, don't we want to expose that to the programmer so that he can take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. and, and then it becomes kind of mysterious how that should work. But there's, is there a, a use case for this as opposed to the, the previous slides exception that just actually does the usual exception behavior? Is this something? Right, so is, is there a use case where you actually uh, want to be able to throw the, some of this state out? Is that right? And then you want to be able to catch it? I'm sorry, let, okay. me, let me say it differently. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> if, it, if you write code to deal with exceptions, yeah. you're, you're writing the code to roll things back or, or make things good again by the time you get to the catch. Right. Right. The only, the only reason I can understand to want to do something like this. I mean, I think what you're what you're saying here is let the transaction mechanism roll the stuff back. Mm -hmm. The way this this works, right? It says let the transaction mechanism roll the stuff back. It's it's as though you didn't want to write the exception handling code. Right. Right. <coughs> right. And right. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what's the motivating case for. This. Okay, and so let me just reiterate what Dave just said, is that <clears throat> what he's saying, at least what I'm understanding, is that when we're writing exception handling code, we're writing it so it can be rolled back. You know, we're, we're doing things off to the side, we're saving like the commit operations to happen at the very end, and then if there's any exceptions along the way, we just throw them when we know we get our unwind semantics. We just get that, and when we get to the catch, no, you know, we, we, we give some guarantee, the strong guarantee, the basic guarantee, something, right? Um, and that this is, is sort of, or, you know, if we, we go back to, to this case, this is, you know, essentially like the opposite of that. And this, this case here is, you know, following sort of what, what we would want to do, but it assumes that, you know, the transaction handles all of that, that you don't, the programmer, him or herself, is not actually writing this code, they're using the TM for it. So, one thing that I'd like to point out is that with TBIS SCM, I mean, just to be totally honest, and I'm not, I, I, I believe that there's some very strong arguments for this. But with TBIS SCM, I built it the way that Dave described, because this is sort of the way that I thought it made sense, is that the, 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 when you throw an exception, it should just automatically roll itself back, and it should, you know, you should be able to have something like this. You shouldn't be able to throw the, the transactional memory state out, and that that is, um, yeah, outside. I understand what you're saying. Okay. That isn't what I described. Okay, this is not what you described. I wasn't trying to say do anything differently. Okay. I, all right. So since you said go at it, let me let me go back and, and explain why I think the the evaluation of state disappearing is wrong. Okay. Okay. Um, or at least at, at least overly conservative. Um, so when an exception is thrown. Uh, in principle, it is copied. Right? The implementation doesn't have to do that, but in principle, it's copied. Okay. <clears throat> so, and this thing you're defining, you're defining new semantics here. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this is a new language extension. So you can, you can reasonably say that this exception, it's, you know, essentially, is constructed outside of the transaction. So, and the TX state. You can also reasonably say that get, that's being copied into the exception. All right. So if, yeah, if you did some memory allocation and what you put as a pointer to that thing, yeah, expect that to be gone by the time you get out of the 
the transaction, sure. Um, but uh, but uh, if it's something with a copy constructor, that copy construction can reasonably happen at the outside of the transaction. You freeze the transaction and copy stuff out of it. Yeah, so it's it's copying. It's not okay. It isn't it isn't the same piece of memory. Okay, Hans. <coughs> I think to have that that new state. Okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, I think these two gentlemen, Hans, you want to go first, then Beeman. Uh, so we actually discussed this, and an earlier version of the, the specification said that. We also discussed it last year, I think, some. Uh, but the problem with it is that the uh, some of the impacts of this are really surprising because the old, if basically the whatever was done inside the transaction uh, just gets undone, gets rolled back, you don't end up uh, invoking destructors correctly and so on. Mm -hmm. So there are scenarios in which if you just copy it out, if you have a shared pointer, for example, inside the exception, you end up with error reference count errors and stuff like that. So the, the way we ended up with, with this situation, which nobody really likes, is that we decide we basically decided okay for an initial attempt let's let's see what we can definitely implement let's put in sort of the the least common denominator and suddenly as you pointed out last year the fact that it doesn't handle standard exception is a bug essentially the fact that it handles no instances of standard exception I think is is, a, is definitely a misfeature so this but this is a really conservative place to stand which I think everybody agrees will have to be revisited uh, shortly. Well, so the other half of, uh, I understand what you're saying. The other half of my, my <coughs> argument here is, yeah, it's a conservative place to stand about something that looks like a really unconservative feature. It looks like, right. it looks like the feature of being able to have the automatic rollback from inside a transaction <coughs> was done without a motivating case. I could be wrong. Well, uh, so, if so, please enlighten me. There is a motivating case. It's the case where you go midway through your transaction and you realize this can never happen. If I don't cancel it, I will constantly get conflict. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't so know how I'm to just throw. Okay, well, that's. Yeah. What's, what's wrong with the previous? Why well, not that's just the regular throw. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, that's well, because right now, regular <coughs> throw doesn't cancel the transaction. But, but why do you exactly. want the, to cancel the transaction? Mm -hmm. That's. So okay, yeah, some I, mean, other I can I can tighter represent the intuition. So I mean, you'd like to be able to take advantage of the rollback mechanism in order to to get strong exception safety, and but it doesn't quite work in this case. Right? So I agree with you. I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not sure I can quite defend this design point either with the, the really strong restrictions on this. I mean, if you could if you had a better solution for this, it might get interesting. So, so basically, you're saying that the motivating Motiv motivation for the feature is to use the transaction to implement the strong exception safety. Right, that seems that seems to be part of it. Can I jump in? Yeah, um, please. Yeah. I, I wonder if people understand that there are actually two things that Justin is or two two features that Justin is pointing out. One is commit on commit um, on 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 a, on on cancel, and the other one is rollback on cancel. So. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that, that's yeah. the first thing, right? Yeah, so, we understand that. Yeah. <coughs> so, so when you have commit on cancel, the problem with that is that you could get in very some, you could see some states inside because they have committed. Right. right. So you right. see some <coughs> states inside. Now that's a counter example, I suppose, not an example to, to support the, the rollback on, uh, on, um, on cancel case, which is what kind of, in, in a way, I'm trying to hear what you, your side is. You, what do people think should happen? Like, do you, is, it, is it your intuition that when an exception right. um, cancel should roll back or right. should it commit? Right, that's, that's a great question, actually. Yeah, yeah. can we see just a show? Yeah, I, that's, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just, just real quickly, yeah, and then, and then we'll, can we just see a show of hands, like, if, if an exception were to happen in a transaction, who thinks the transaction should be aborted? Roll back. Roll back, roll back. Depends what you call it, transaction or account. Yeah, I think it's okay. <laughs> okay, and then and then uh, so then uh, the people who think that it should commit if if uh, an exception is thrown. Okay, okay, so it's like maybe three to one in favor of uh, a rolling back. So, so so yeah yeah jump in jump in just. My opposing embrace in that transaction box should be a commit right, and that should be the only place that it commits. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's saying, <coughs> right, right. This is the point where you commit anything prior to that is is an unwind. Uh, yeah, that's my intuition too, but I think, but I think that this whole this whole question is a little bit premature. Okay. Because because I think that there's there's um, a non consideration. I think there's a, a lack of of having considered the sort of semantics of how, how much overlap there is between the semantics of transactions and the semantics of ordinary programs. Right. And, and, and you know, Dave, that's, that's quite, quite possible. That, you know, the people that are working on this are, you know, they're experts in TM and may not be experts in, are we running out of time? Okay. So, uh, Beeman has had his hand up for a while. Do you, do you want to ask a question? I just wanted to say that I think a, an approach that is so conservative that it prohibits all sorts of behavior that is perfectly well defined on the copy of the day talking about is just does, it's, it's not a good way to do things. It's very counterintuitive. I mean, I think when any of them, I mean, the moment I see exception, I assume an ex there are certain things an exception that shouldn't come out of an exception. It's no surprise. Mm -hmm. there's, not a, there's not an iota of surprise there that some things, like a shared pointer or something like that, shouldn't be part of that except, you know, thrown out of there. Right. But, that, that. But, but, I mean, all the time you want to include diagnostic information. Right, and, right. And to prohibit that is just... It's a non-starter as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. The, 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 the perfect example for that is that um, I can return the address of a local variable out of a function. I really shouldn't do that. It's stupid. But the language doesn't prevent me from doing that. Maybe, you know, it'd be great if the language did or something, but it's like, no, we want you to be able to return pointers out of functions. So, yes, you can return a pointer to a local and you'll crash. It's the exact same thing. I'm trying to return the state out of something that goes away. Right, right. So, yeah, it's no so why not? It's no surprise. Right, right. It's nonsensical and seems very obvious that this should be illegal is what you're saying. What you're saying is the design should just allow it. Right, and if you do the illegal behavior, you get into, yeah, yeah. And it looks like we, so I think that we're, we're ending now, so I'm just going to uh, quickly just jump to the end here. Um, essentially, here's my email address, basically just my name and and uh, at intel.com, please email me and, and you know, let's, we definitely want to work with you guys more about this. The, the, the point of this talk really was to sort of rehash what happened last year and to sort of, you know, try to set the bar right so we all understand basically what the, the C++ TM spec offers and acknowledge its shortcomings and to have you guys help us. One of the areas that, that's very important to understand is that we may be experts in TM, but we may not be experts in exception handling. And so we really do need your feedback. We need you to guide us. Um, so let's, you know, let's keep working in that direction and please don't don't shoot us yet we a lot of the early design was just try to make it as simple as possible to try to get all of our compiler people to implement it okay and now that we've done that now I think we may be able to take the next step to be able to address some of these concerns that that all of you are making so okay great thank you, thank you.